everyone, and welcome to A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie. And I am always thrilled when we have this opportunity to come and sit and talk and dialogue together about the things that are important to us related to balance, our health, and everyday concerns that we go through. Today, we're going to be talking about something very important, which is our health. As you know, April is National Minority Health Month. And believe it or not, in 1915, in April, Dr. Booker T. Washington stopped the presses, paused everything, and he requested that there be a National Negro Health Awareness Week. This is what we know today as National Minority Health Month. This gives us an opportunity to sit back and talk about those things that are important to our lives, for he said that if our health fails and we don't have long life, then everything goes wrong. This gives us a space to be able to talk about today what advocacy looks like, who are you talking to? How are people talking to you? And how are you making certain you get the things that you need related to your physical, mental, spiritual, social, emotional well-being? All of these things are key to us being able to live a balanced life. Today, we're going to be joined by Dr. Tierney, our Level Up coach, Stacey Owens, our author and educator and coach. We're also joined today by Catrice Nolan, breast cancer survivor, as well as host of Resilient Stories with Catrice Nolan. We're also joined today by Ricky Fairley. She is the founder of the Black Breast Cancer Alliance. And we're going to be joined by our resident obstetrician and gynecologist, Dr. Glory Ivory Crow. Welcome in, everyone. Wow. I know that was a mouthful. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. You know, I feel like I'm in the presence of great and important people because there are so many questions that I have today surrounding our health and things that relate to how do we keep it going in the midst of all of the health disparities that we face? Everything associated with being Black women and Black men, our children today are facing so many things that are post-pandemic related. And oftentimes, I know that our viewing audience can feel like they've had it up to here with everything that goes on in each of our lives. So I'm going to start with Dr. Glory Ivy Crow. So Dr. Crow, my question for you today is, as it relates to health equity and disparities, what are some of the things that we are facing in larger numbers than other races and people in various age groups? Well, in terms of disparities, especially for African Americans, you know, amidst the other minority groups that we have, we have a lot of disparities when it comes to access. We have disparities related to um, cancer diagnosis, access, financial resources, um, insurance, a lot of different things. And those things will be highlighted as we move forward with the changes, as we get a move out of the pandemic and start removing some of those resources that people were able to get access to because of the pandemic. So that will be a, a testament of what we need to at least look at for uh, the disparities that we're dealing with a lot with our um, uh, African-American population, at least. Let me ask you a follow up question, because I've noticed that we are living longer, 65 and older. That's not really necessarily retirement age anymore. Everybody's out and about and enjoying life. But there also seems to be this disparity in the sense that younger African-Americans are now showing up with some of the diseases that older African-Americans would show up with related to you know, high blood pressure, depression, mental anxiety. How are these affecting um, people being able to live and thrive? Well, I think our younger generation has a lot more stressors, a little bit different. We came up in a generation where when it came to our health, we ate, we were a lot more healthier in terms of our nutrition. Our nutrition was better. Some of our stresses were a little bit different. We had a different ways to handle it. This generation has a lot of peer pressure, a lot of stress, a lot of things when it relates to just exposure every day. They have a lot of peer pressure. So a lot of their um, illnesses that they deal with, whether it's obesity, their, their nutrition is not the same. They're eating a lot different. So when we, whereas we see type 2 diabetes later in life, a lot of these kids are getting a type 2 to diabetes a lot easier, I mean, excuse me, a lot sooner. So the chronic illnesses, sometimes they're dealing with a lot um, sooner than we would. Also hypertension, we're seeing that in younger kids, once again, their nutrition is, is different. Their access 
to food, their uh, food insecurities, their total nutrition, all those are a little bit different than what we had to deal with. So we're going to see a lot of that sooner. We're seeing a lot more mental health issues with our kids too, because of the, you know, a lot of the pressures that they deal with just with peer pressure, it has such an enormous impact on them. And so you're seeing them coming out with depression, as you point out so rightfully, and a lot more of, um, uh, more, about, more about depression. That's the biggest thing you see. Some anxiety, but a lot more depression. And I think that has a lot to do with peer pressure around them as well. I want to talk about that for a moment. But before I do, you mentioned something related to some of the illnesses that our young people are experiencing, but also mothers and parents. And in your field of OBGYN, can you share with us a little bit about gestational diabetes? I know that that comes up when mothers are pregnant and oftentimes it's not something they considered that they would get. So how do people advocate for themselves when they get an onset illness through pregnancy that they did not have before getting pregnant and delivering their child? Well, what happens is when we start diagnosing gestational diabetes, usually if they're coming in with no prior history, then we're, we're diagnosing that somewhere between 24 and 28 weeks when we're actually doing some testings. We spend a considerable amount of time once they're diagnosed is sending them for education. The education piece is very important because it's an opportunity for the nutritionist to step in heretofore where they may not have that guidelines in terms of what they needed to eat. That nutritionist shows them a pattern of what they need to put out there, how many calories they need to do. It shows them how to do testing. And then the one thing that people don't re always remember is 50% of those women who are gestational diabetics will go on to later on become true diabetics. So the onus is on us as providers that once these women deliver, that we still continue to monitor them as well as their primary health care providers to look at them and watch out for them because these people are, are set up for a chronic disease illness down the way. So what we're trying to do is always put in place something to make sure that the education they need, we're providing them with the resources, the testing supplies that they need, and we're keeping the eye on them. That's a woman that we're gonna do more monitoring on. We're gonna do more monitoring on her to make sure she stays within the right uh, range for her numbers. Her A1C is adequate because that has an impact on the fetus and the developing fetus, as well as we're gonna look at her to make sure we hook her into a specialist early on so we can prevent and look for any sort of anomalies that may come out of that. Perfect segue, Dr. Crow, because you talked about peer pressure in our young people. Now with the gestational and then the juvenile diabetes, is that passed on to the child or is juvenile diabetes something that comes from other stressors like overeating sweets to manage anxiety and things of that nature? In most cases, juvenile diabetes or what we refer to as type one diabetes is, ge is genetic. And that's a person who does not have the ability to, pr to produce insulin to make once we encounter any sugar in our bloodstream to be able to bring that value down. For those of us who, the more familiar one that we hear about in our older population or now in our population of 20s and 30s are the, the people that get, develop type 2 diabetes. And type 2 diabetes is a result of you're using up that insulin that you've been provided with. We don't all have uh, a supply of insulin that's just endless. We do all each have a certain supply of insulin. And so if we lose that, then we lose the ability as long as we continue to live and encounter some sort of carbohydrate in our diet, we, st we lose the ability to be able to decrease those um, levels of glucose down. And we know that sugar has an impact on so many different ways, whether it's affecting our kidneys, whether it's affecting our heart, whether it affects our blood vessels. So it has an impact. The kids who are um, born with it, that's a more brittle patient to try to manage because they have no insulin. So we've got to be able to provide an outside source of insulin. The nice thing about it is we can identify a lot of these things much sooner we have better products on the market to be able to help us manage these patients much better than we had in the past. Thank you for sharing that information. I want to ask Dr. Tierney a question related to how do we manage stressors when we find out that we have a diagnosis that was either unexpected or one that we knew at some point would develop because of our genetics? How do we manage those stressors of unseen things? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
Well, the first thing is to not panic. That's the first thing. Usually when we hear something like that, particularly when it's unexpected, we immediately jump to the worst case scenario. You know, oh my God, I'm going to die. <laughs> you know, so the first thing is to just not panic. And then the second thing is to do exactly what Dr. Ivy is saying. Work closely with your healthcare provider. You know, get get all of the information that you need to, the information that they're giving you, what, what the nutritionist is saying, and then just work your plan. You know, and know that if you are working your plan, then this too can be controlled, even even eliminated, you know, altogether. But when we get ourselves, ourselves in a state of panic and we start going to the worst case scenario, we're actually making the situation worse. So just stay calm, work closely with your health care provider and work your plan. Thank you for sharing that information. When we come back after the break, I want to talk a little bit more about health equity with Patrice Nolan and also, excuse me, I want to talk when we come back about health equity and as it relates to breast cancer and how we are affected. We're going to have that conversation with Patrice Nolan and Ricky Fairley when we're back after the break. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media and investment. This next generation social app has already raised $10 million and has just opened a new round to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. As bad as Trump was, his economy was worse, and black America felt it the most. He cut health insurance while giving tax breaks to the wealthy and big business. He stoked racial violence, attacked voting rights, and if reelected, vowed to be a dictator and, quote, get revenge. We can't go back. As president, I put money in pockets, creating millions of new jobs, and capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month. There's a lot more to do, but we can do it together. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. Welcome back, everyone, to A Balanced Life. Statistics are showing us that 29% of African-American women are often diagnosed with some form of breast cancer, and that's at a higher rate than some of our female counterparts in other races. Catrice and Ricky, join us. Hey, ladies. Hey, Jackie. I'm excited that you are here to talk to us about what you do in the space related to breast cancer. Oftentimes, health equity it's, it's not fair across the balance when they have difficulty getting doctor's appointments, seeing someone that will take them seriously when they say they find a lump. I want to start with Ricky. Talk to us, Ricky, about your organization and the work that you do related to TOUCH and the Black Breast Cancer Alliance. We don't have health equity in the breast cancer space. I don't think across the board we have health inequity. What does that mean? I don't think that we will have health equity until every healthcare professional practices the golden rule, what your mother taught you weren't when you were two years old, treat others as you want to be treated. And that's not happening. Frankly, in breast cancer, we're in a crisis situation. We have a 41% higher mortality rate than white women. We have a 39% higher recurrence rate of breast cancer than white women. Black women under 35 get breast cancer at twice the rate and die at three times the rate of white women. And we get triple negative breast cancer, which is what I had, the worst one at three times the rate of white women. And frankly, the drugs aren't working for us. When you look at the standard of care that we have for breast cancer, there were no black bodies considered in the development of those treatments. And even the protocols like when to get a mammogram, 40 is too late for us. So we're really challenging all of the science. We are challenging every day all of the science. We're trying to get better science for black women. Um, we're working with the pharmaceutical companies to get, you know, get more black women recruited into clinical trials, get them retained in clinical trials and really, you know, kind of fight this disease with different drugs. So we're, you know, we are, won't, won't let up until we can get the pharmaceutical companies to recognize that their baby is ugly and that the drugs aren't working for us and we need better drugs. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I think some people would agree with you in that space, especially those who have been through and are experiencing such a diagnosis. Catrice, in your area of advocacy and health equity, how are you engaging and helping women through their stories and others discover how do you show up in that space and use your voice? So thank you for um, having me, Jackie. So work that I've been doing in this space has been related to the support system. So many of us Black families, we rely upon each other heavily. And in many instances, a lot of us aren't necessarily sure how to best communicate with our health care providers or even um, kind of put together that, that key team that, that, that you can have in place to be able to navigate such a devastating diagnosis such as cancer. And so um, I have an online um, group called Families Navigating Cancer, where we discuss with family members how they can best support their loved ones. Um, also, uh, a number of uh, interviews online on Instagram, where we talk about families navigating cancer, uh, what families have gone through. And it's through those stories that others are able to learn how to better navigate the situation. Mm, navigation is important. I want to invite Stacy into the conversation because as an educator working with children and having your own staff, oftentimes children bring into their space the feelings of home. And I know we say this all the time in the Black community, what happens in this house stays in this house. But oftentimes children wear their emotions on their sleeve. You can see it in their little faces. So Stacy, talk to us about you as an educator, how do you help children manage the things that their parents may be going through so that they can academically and emotionally show up and still live their best little life? I, I think just to follow up with what the ladies just said, awareness is key. So whenever we have families that's dealing with illnesses at home, um, kids know a little bit about it. And so we watch for their body language. We watch for how, you know, the changes that they may be experiencing in the classroom. And then um, we have conversations with them. We try to help take whatever the big problem is and put it into a small chunk of information that they can understand so that they can have a greater understanding of what their parent or family member may be experiencing and then start developing their ability to have empathy towards it so that they can know the role that they need to play as support people or how they need to process, you know, what they need to do in those times of need. Like I'll say, for example, I have a, a family has, um, mother just gave birth and the baby has a series of issues and mom had to stay in the hospital with the baby for about six months. And so now you, you have this child at home being raised by a young 18 year old brother. For us, we're concerned about, okay, what are you eating? And, and he, this child could come and tell us, oh, we're, we're eating dino bites, you know, and, and now it's an, an increase of um, processed foods. And that was starting to impact that child's behavior in the classroom because that child was diagnosed with ADHD. So we started having conversations about making healthier choices and then providing some healthier choices that we can send home to the family. So it's just about being aware and then helping them think through the process of how they can play their small part in the process. Thank you for sharing that, because oftentimes advocacy is for the advocacy is for the youngest person to the oldest person who is surrounded in the particular situation that the family is going through. Now, Ricky, as you relates to touch and the organization, you, you mentioned something related to how people have the assistance that's needed and that inequities are consistent. What ways do you prepare and teach people to show up when they're going to their doctor's appointment so that they have the right words to say to get the kind of care that they need? We use a lot of video on our website. If you go to whenwetrial.org, that's our clinical trial website. And we basically teach black women how to advocate for themselves, what questions to ask their doctors. We give them examples of situations that, that breasties were in where they had to advocate for themselves. And we try to we try to dot all the I's and cross all the T's and equipping them, you know, and, and I, I think I do a lot of great things in the world for breast women, black women, but but what I know I can't change is the illicit bias of, of white doctors. 
And we're seeing it every day happen every day with our patients. And so where I can make a difference is by teaching black women. So we spend a lot of time on the words to use, how to say it, when to say it, and to equip them information so they can ask the right questions. We're now finding out some every day of a new study that was done that shows that black women weren't included and, and they're making decisions based on these studies. And so we really have to help them know that they have to question everything. And, and it boils down to saying to your doctor, when you get a treatment plan, okay, doctor, is that what you would offer to your mom, to your grandma, to your auntie, to your daughter? And challenging the doctor every in every situation to make sure they're getting the care they deserve. So we just try to teach them and, and make them feel good about it and powerful in their illness. You know, when you get diagnosed with cancer, it's like somebody turned the light off. And you're in the dark and you're just trying to find the light. You're trying to find your way out. So we try to give them what they need to try to find their way out of that darkness with doctors. You've been a big proponent of trials. What role do trials play in an African-American woman's life with the diagnosis? If we don't have trials, we'll never get the drugs we need. The drugs we have are not working. And frankly, if you're a black woman under 40, and I'm not a doctor, I'm a marketing person, but if you're a black woman under 40 and you get breast cancer and you get triple negative breast cancer, your best treatment option is a clinical trial. That's where we have the best drugs. And I think there's a fear that we're gonna get the sugar pill and die. There is no sugar pill in cancer research. You're gonna get a standard of care drug or you're gonna get something better that could save your life and also pave the way for the future of our children. But it's so critical to participate in trials. It's the best science we have right now. It's the best drugs we can get. We know that, that the 41% higher mortality rate is showing that the treatments that are in place right now are just not effective for us. And so clinical trials are our best way out. And we actually have a nurse navigator program where we provide a navigator to people in trials to help them through, to help them understand it, to help educate their families about it, and really just help them be feel informed and equipped to handle the science and, and participate. Absolutely. Catrice, how do you walk the people that you deal with through what it is that they are going through? Why is having someone alongside you important to all stages of the health? Oh, it's, it's so important because in many instances, it's that support person that they're confiding in. It's that support person that they're leaning on to, you know, give them the assistance that they need. And in many instances, that support person feels overwhelmed just as much as that patient does because they feel like I am this, I'm going to be that connector to help them through this situation, but they don't feel um, adequately prepared. And so um, what I'll do with some of my clients that I coach is we'll just have a conversation, understanding how they're feeling, um, where are they feeling overwhelmed, what stages of process are they in, uh, what type of resources have they gotten access to? and also share with them the other amazing resources that are also readily avail available for them. You know, organizations like Ricky's um, Touch, you know, many individuals do not know that um, she has a program when we trial. So it's about sharing those resources that are tailored for that particular family because there's a lot of things out there, but it's unique, it's custom, what a particular individual or family truly need to help them in their specific journey. Mm, beauty. That's very interesting word that you use because each of us has a role and a responsibility. Dr. Tierney, oftentimes people are fearful of fearful of stepping into spaces that are unfamiliar to them. How do you help us level up as everyday advocates for people in need? Absolutely. So particularly when we're talking about the, the healthcare industry, I love that uh, what Ricky just said about the trials, you know, oftentimes in the, particularly in the black community, there's a lot of fear around trials because of the history in our community where trials are concerned. Um, but the thing about it, if we continue to, to do the same thing, then we'll get the same result, you know? So the best thing here is to be, become comfortable being uncomfortable. You know, if you are, you know, have the information about a trial or something else to do um, that will improve your health, then the best thing you can do is get as much information about it as you can. Again, talk to your providers and then take those baby steps forward um, with this knowledge and wisdom that you do have. You know, and this isn't just in terms of breast cancer. This is also in terms of mental health. You know, one of the good things that came out of the pandemic is that it made all of us really start to focus in on our mental health, you know, and take it more seriously where once upon a time it was like, oh, if you got a therapist, you're crazy. 
you know, um, that was the the stigma that came along with it. But taking that step and getting uncomfortable to say, no, I actually need some help. No, I need to talk with someone, you know, before I do, you know, lose my marbles, you know, here. So being comfortable, being uncomfortable and taking the necessary steps that you need to take for your health, for your health and your well-being is paramount in order for you to get the healing that you absolutely need. When we come back after the break, we're going to talk a little bit more about trials, but also let's engage in a conversation as it relates to institutional bias. Oftentimes you can't get the help that you need because of the way you look when we're back after the break. Bambase is pioneering a new era of social media and investment. This next generation social app has already raised $10 million and has just opened a new round to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. As bad as Trump was, his economy was worse, and black America felt it the most. He cut health insurance while giving tax breaks to the wealthy and big business. As president, I put money in pockets and capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month. There's a lot more to do, but we can do it together. Welcome back everyone to A Balanced Life. And as you can tell, navigating the waters related to all dynamics of our health are extremely important. And sometimes it requires us to use our voice, but there are things that we don't know about what's happening in spaces and places that we've never been before. I wanna talk to Gloria Ivy Crow about that. Dr. Crow, come on in and share with me, with all of us about things related to trials and why sometimes we're left out of that space. And then what role does institutional bias play from a doctor's perspective in getting overall care? Well, a lot of what we've talked about so far has been that we are not included in trials. And that's very important because we are affected by so many of these diseases at a much more alarming rate. The treatment is not there. We don't have the drugs. We don't always have the research that's being done to be able to look at what happens when an African-American is affected by these different illnesses. And a lot of it is just like Dr. Turney said, we have this stigma that has been attached and a lot of folks are very, very fearful about engaging in clinical trials because they feel like they're being a guinea pig and that they, like like they said before, they could possibly be getting a sugar pill. They're not actually getting medications. There's that fear that they're just used as a, their number don't really matter. The statistics aren't there. And so there is a lot of um, things that we need to do more of as providers. We need to advocate for our patients as much as as we can. A lot of times when a diagnosis is made for breast cancer, unfortunately, when we get them as a provider, we get the responsibility, of course, to tell and share that information with our patients. But then our patients become captured in a whole different system. We refer them to another provider who's a specialist in that area in congruency with the uh, radiology, the oncologist, the breast surgeon. That person is pulled from out of our contact base for about, usually you don't see, we don't see our patients back for nine months to a year after they've gone through, they've gone through the diagnosis. And in some cases, when they have to have any additional sort of treatment, whether that consists of chemo or radiation, sometimes we get the benefit to be able to get back a pathology report or an operative report to get an idea of what goes on. But a lot of times our patients get pulled from out of our purview so that what we can try to do at, at the most when we get that opportunity to hear some things with them is to refer them, to give them some resource information. But a lot of times we're hoping and, and relying that they're getting a lot of that benefit from the oncologist who has the on the the on-hand information about what clinical trials are offered because a lot of times that information doesn't, filtered down to the to the primary care provider. It's held at the level of the oncologist, and we're hoping that the oncologist is being able to um, provide that information. 
in terms of institutional bias, sometimes we see it just in the from the context of when someone presents with some symptoms that may not be necessarily on the same um, line as what we're familiar with, or the person may be in the in the age group where you may think they're they're too young to be able to um, experience either a breast cancer. So we have to be careful as providers on our end that we listen to our patients, that we don't get caught up into this person doesn't look like this um, particular picture of the person who normally presents. And as we shared earlier, as these 40 is sometimes too late, getting a very good history is gonna is important for us so that we can be able to look at the information that our patients present or the history that they come in with to see whether or not there's any genetic risks that we need to be concerned about. Do some genetic sort of testing so that we don't pigeonhole that person into a certain way that they need to look, they need to be this age, we don't expect it at this age. I mean, we can get someone who's in their early 20s, very common to find some women that do present with breast cancer at that time, but we have to be careful as providers that we continue to educate ourselves and that we be an advocate and listen to our patients. Mm, absolutely. Stacy. you provide a space for your employees to be able to kind of step back from their day to day because outside of breast cancer, we have stroke, we have high blood pressure, we have thyroid disease, we have stress, we have heart disease. There's so many other things that come into play because of the work that we do oftentimes. How and why is it important to you that employees find time to kind of step back? And I know you talk about that in your book. You know, how do we create these environments and recognize that without our people, we also cannot thrive and survive? Correct. So, you know, again, you want to keep talking about what's going on in your life. Do you recognize when your stress levels are, are raising and and then when you when you get in those moments of you're starting to deal with health issues, are you taking time for the self care? Are you taking time to balance yourself? You know, exercise, eat right. Um, we we have a, a reset room where in the middle of the day, if you're having a moment, we want you to be able to step back and go and recenter yourself and just be in tune with what you're feeling and what you're thinking and what is changing in your everyday life, so you can get a, ahead of it. You know, that's the thing. We want to, um, um, about what, 14% of the population understands health literacy and knowing how to find information, use information for the betterment of themselves. So here in our environment, we do things like partner with people in the community. We're putting on a health fair this month to, to celebrate um, National Minority Health Month. And it's just so we know with our staff and with our families, a lot of times, they just don't know. So when you know better, you do better, right? So if you can provide those opportunities where you can find non-threatening environments for you to learn more about what you may be dealing with, it will increase your opportunity and chances of stepping out and trusting or uh, uh, giving some trust to the medical profession because of the population I serve, you know, Google tells them the answer of what to do when you're sick and not feeling like how you need to feel. And so we're we're saying, hey, no, find the information, reach out and find those partners in the community that can talk like you, sound like you, present the information culturally for you so that you can increase your in your um, awareness and, and make the, the healthy choices that you need to make in order to be here for as long as you can for all of those who need you. So we provide that here in our space when we ask our staff and families to step back and just mm -hmm. take Thank time. Thank you for sharing that. I want to ask Patrice a question because sometimes institutional bias is systemic bias and it doesn't oftentimes come from the medical professional. Sometimes we in our own families feel the need to withhold information from our children. When you were going through your medical crisis and diagnosis, your children were young and they become aware of things that you have gone through. At what point did you decide to share with your children to kind of stop what we call in our families generational curses of withholding information that really could be vital to their own health and awareness? So Jackie, that's a that's an excellent point. Um, so our family, we decided to tell our children very early on. Um, we knew that they were going to see that you know there's going to be different people who are perhaps coming to the house. You know, mommy's going to lose her hair, and you know there was just no way to just walk around the situation and what was going on. And so we felt it was important to tell them right away, uh, within perhaps a day of me receiving the diagnosis. 
we were very honest with them to share with them, you know, mommy's going to have some health challenges and um, there's going to be people who are going to come and help. You're going to feel so much love in this space. And, you know, if you need something, you know, mommy and daddy are here as well as other family members. And it's been 10 years since, um, you know, we had that conversation since I was diagnosed and our children at the time were only age three. They were in third grade and sixth grade. And so we've had for the past 10 years, continued conversations, you know, subsequent um, surgeries that I've had that we've explained. And I think it's helped them to be a bit more comfortable sharing how they're feeling um, and, and, and then also sharing it with their friends when necessary. So their friends all know um, it just makes for a, um, a more palatable situation where people don't feel um, as if they're being, you know, not told the, the right information. Um, I've also seen it opposite where there's perhaps someone who's older who's going through a cancer diagnosis and they're not wanting to tell their kids because they feel like they're going to be a burden to the children. And that's when I say to some of those older individuals that, you know, if I, as a mom, can tell my children who are at a young age, then you as an older adult, please know that you are not a burden. You are well loved and your family wants to help you. And if they can't help you directly, they want to find some resources that can assist. And so please know you are not a burden. You are loved. And that's what I try to coach my clients on. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to jump the block. I'm going to go to a break because I think we need to have a really big substantive conversation about how we have conversation, because oftentimes our fear of our diagnosis, our fear of how people will perceive what we go through can keep us from getting the help that we need. When we come back after the break, we're going to have a little roundtable about all those things surrounding fear when we're back in a moment. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media and investment. This next generation social app has already raised $10 million and has just opened a new round to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. As bad as Trump was, his economy was worse, and black America felt it the most. He cut health insurance while giving tax breaks to the wealthy and big business. He stoked racial violence, attacked voting rights, and if reelected, vowed to be a dictator and, quote, get revenge. We can't go back. As president, I put money in pockets, creating millions of new jobs, and capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month. There's a lot more to do, but we can do it together. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. Welcome back, everyone, to A Balanced Life. And we've heard a lot of information. And I know that some of you are sitting at home saying, oh, my God, I need to talk to someone. I need to tell somebody. But oftentimes we are paralyzed by fear. We sometimes don't even go to the doctor because we know our genealogy. We know what's been passed down. And we saw grandmama, big mama, auntie, and everybody else suffer through. And then all of a sudden we're at a funeral and nobody knew what was going on. Come on in, everybody. Let's have this family conversation um, for our audience with each other there so that we can begin to help people not feel paralyzed. One, you got to go to the doctor, get checked out. Dr. Crow, how often should people go to the doctor and get an exam? In general, we would like to see people at least once a year. Sometimes for different chronic conditions, they require more repetitive visits, maybe every three to six months because you're following different things, whether it's thyroid, whether it's cholesterol, whether it's glucose, you're following some problems that need to be right, you need to be right on top of it. So in general, you'd like to see people at least once a year, but that can be changed and tailored to depending on what their illness is and how stable or unstable it is. 
Okay, so you said illness stable or unstable. And I'm gonna ask Dr. Tierney this question because sometimes the patient can be stable or unstable because some of us jar easy. I don't consider myself someone who gets kind of set back on their heels, but every now and then, you know, things kind of take me by surprise. So Dr. Tierney, talk to us about that for a moment. How do we brace ourselves mm -hmm. when we've already not been to the doctor? Probably many watching haven't been since we've come through this pandemic. So how do we brace ourselves to get ready to go in? This is where your support system is critical. Um, if you know that you get set back on your heels easily or you get the jitters, you know, easily, this is not the time to avoid the thing. This is where this is the time for you in, to invite someone with you in the thing, you know, and I'm saying this as I'm not just as the coach or just it sounds like a good idea, but someone that has done it, you know, I, I, had a uh, fortunate incident with uh, one of my doctors and went in for a regular checkup and she just scared the bejesus out of me after I just asked one simple question. And so after that, and you know, encounter, I decided to switch doctors and was going to a new doctor. And the first thing I did was call my friend and say, hey, will you go to the doctor with me? I need you to hold my hand, you know, as I go to this doctor. And a lot of times we, we, we think that that's only for kids, right? You know, we, we all know, okay, when you take your kid to the doctor, you don't send your kid in the back by themselves. You know, you go back there with them because your child doesn't know what to expect, you know, what's going to happen, if they're going to have to get a shot or if they're going to get a lollipop at the end. Well, it's the same thing for us, sugar. It doesn't matter. You might be 40, 50. I don't care. Go to the doctor with me, you know? And so this is where instead of doing um, that fear response, of that flight. And so we run away from the doctor. We run away from the appointment. We need to run towards it, but invite someone to come with me. And I can guarantee if you call your loved one, that person that you know that you can you can trust and say, hey, I have this doctor appointment. Will you go with me? I doubt that they're going to tell you no. You know, same thing with my friend. She was like, absolutely. What time is the appointment? I'll be there. You know, so inviting people into that space you know, before anything. And then definitely once you, if you get a diagnosis, making sure that you have those people in the space with you. A lot of times what we do is we try to shoulder that on our own, shoulder that diagnosis, shoulder whatever the doctor said and not want to burden, you know, anybody with that. But we're really supposed to be in community with each other. So sharing that with someone else, helping them or allowing them to help you carry that load, that is what will help really you to be healthier in the end because you're not holding all of that stress internally and then expecting to have a healthy diagnosis on the other side while you're allowing the stress to eat you up on the inside. So making sure that you are really tapping into your support system before when you go into the doctor, while you're at the doctor and after whatever, you know, diagnosis or whatever the doctor said that you now have to walk through, having your team with you is critical. I find that so interesting. So this is true confession. <laughs> I do not have high blood pressure. But when I go to the dentist, they take my blood pressure and my blood pressure is always up when I go to the dentist. And I don't know if it's a fear of having my blood pressure checked and then them telling me I have high blood pressure. But my doctor says I do not. And I do not know how I will get over that. So let me ask Catrice a question, because you work in that advocacy space of being able to give people a sense of peace and calm and help them come to terms with all that they go through. So for people like me who have this fear or anxiety about not knowing what an outcome will be, how are we helping our audience discover how to kind of settle down um, prior to getting to wherever it is that they're going? You know, it takes our community getting more comfortable with having health conversations. Mm. And in many instances, that begins at a young age. Um, and even for us older adults, it's the conversations we have with family members. Uh, our family has a group chat. My immediate family has one, as well as my parents and my siblings. And in that group chat, we're checking on each other on a regular basis. We're asking the questions about health. We're asking, you know, well, when did, when would, when did mom go for her eye checkup? You know, when is dad going to go for this checkup? And then we pick up the phone and we're talking through it and we're easing, um, you know, what you're talking about is anxiety, health anxiety. So we're having conversations to ease the health anxiety that they might be having on, you know, all the what ifs. Well, if I go, what are they going to tell me? Um, just like Dr. Tierney said, um, you know, that are they going to say this one thing and that one thing is going to spiral, 
you know, my whole life out of control. You know, I've been, uh, I've been there. I've heard that one thing that spiraled everything out of control. And you know what eased that anxiety, that feeling of, of spiraling? It was having conversations with others who have had similar diagnosis, um, similar stories, and it was hearing those stories, or even just reading in the stories of those journeys, the success in those journeys that eased, you know, the feelings that I had and made me like say, okay, it, it, it's okay. I can, I can step through this because I've seen others do the same thing. Mm. I think those are important keys for us to consider. You know, we can step through it because we've taken the time to have some health conversations. And I know that's not something we always do in our community because we don't like to talk about stuff. You know, we just kind of let it sit over there on the back burner and simmer until it boils over. And then all of a sudden it's a crisis for everyone. Ricky Fairley, talk to our audience about the things that they need to say when they see it or how they can navigate better their own crisis and anxiety related to health. Well, you know, we like to say that we take people to and through the breast cancer experience. And so earlier this year, we launched a campaign called For the Love of My Girls, spelled G-U-R-L-S. And we said, you know, if black breast cancer is a different thing and it's different for us and we're dying more, then black breast health is different. And I think that goes across all health. And what does that mean? That means looking at your health and understanding your health and, and making it something you do as an act of self-care. So, for example, we, we basically want people to understand that, you know, we do get these diseases in worse stages. You know, when, when, when black people get, you know, when white people get a cold, we get pneumonia and everything. Right. So so we have a different we have different levels of disease than white people. But also know your her story. Talk to your grandmas on both sides. Talk to your aunties. Talk to your grandfathers. Talk about it. So you so you start to have these conversations at the kitchen table so that you become comfortable with, with stuff that people have in your family. And we have a tool on our website, loveofmygirls.org, that basically is a tool to help you pull these conversations out of your grandparents that may not want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. get, get them comfortable with the questions that, that you, the things that you need to know. So we have a tool for that. Here's what you ask them. Here's how you ask them. Here's the setting you ask them in. You know, have a tea party or whatever. Take them, you know, do it after dinner when, over ice cream. But we give suggestions of how to have these important conversations. And then in the breast cancer space, know your girls, know your body, but make it an act of self-care. So it's not about disease, but it's about, you know, check your breast when you get your nails done. Check your breast when you go out with your girls. Check your breast as, as something that you just do as part of your monthly routine when you buy tampons, whatever. And I think it would really apply as a across all diseases, but it just I think we need to make these conversations happen at the kitchen table and make the family comfortable. Like I'm for my family. We did it yesterday for Easter. Before we eat dinner, I make everybody talk about, okay, when was your last PSA test? Who got their A1C check? What's your blood pressure? Or you can't eat the food I cooked. And I, I make kind of force these conversations. My family hated it at first. We've been doing it for about five years now. Okay, Ricky, okay, I'll tell you my blood pressure. But, um, but it makes, you have to make the conversations a family conversation. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to talk about it. But, but it has to be done, like, not related to somebody dying. Like, you know, we wait till there's, you know, Uncle Pookie gets his leg amputated before we say what happened, right? So it has to be something that you keep talking about on a regular basis. So people are comfortable with it and say, hey, I, I just got my blood pressure checked. Isn't that great? Or, or you know, or, or I didn't have such a good report. What do I do? And then the family's involved in the conversation. So there are no surprises. And we know we're, what we have, what to look out for, what to be aware of. So it has to be an ongoing thing. I think you bring up a very valid point. It's sort of like social media. We only see the A side. Nobody sees the B side of life, you know, on social media. And Stacy, when we think about, we always show the A side, but we never talk about the B side, the things that burden us, the things that are bothering us. How do we manage to keep moving forward and engaging in those level of conversations? Because I've heard you say that even with your personal child and the challenges that you went through with your son when he had his diagnosis, how do we engage in those levels as parents and as everyday adults? <laughs> I think you just have to keep moving. And, you know, that's that's how I have managed it myself uh, in terms of and when I say keep moving, I'm, I'm going to recognize that I'm human and I have these feelings and burdens and I'm going to have these negative thoughts. But I need to be aware of my negative thoughts. So as soon as I have one, 
I can replace that thought with something positive, something hopeful. And then that will put give me the energy to put myself in a different space and start looking at it from a different outcome. So um, knowledge, having those conversations like the other ladies have talked about is so key. Like you don't want to suffer in silence and suffer alone. So when you're going through these things, you know, yeah, I tell people all the time, you see the outcome, the good side of it, but you didn't see me crying at night. You didn't see my str my struggles that I had at night. But if I'm having conversations with people, then I'm hearing they were crying too. They were struggling too. So what did you do? And then that gives me options. So I think just being comfortable and finding your community or a community that you can get in and talk to and be vulnerable and share all aspects of it can give you a complete picture so that you can keep moving. Mm. So let's do that, Stacey. I'm going to start with you and go back up the line. Give some words of positivity to our viewers who may be going through, you know, we always say we're either coming into, going through, or coming out of some type of a situation related to our health. And some days we have great health. So start with you. Give us some positivity. Everything you need, you have it within self. So all you have to do is activate that. And by that, I mean that it's nothing new under the sun. When we're experiencing in life, it's already been experienced somewhere else in some form or some fashion. So let's just connect with those that can bring light to our situation and help us keep going. Mm, absolutely. Ricky Fairley. Peace is non-negotiable. Your peace is non-negotiable. Whatever's going to give you peace, you you have to have peace you have to have peace in your life and you have to find that in however you can and, and for the people that don't have joy all around them you need to get rid of the people that are not giving you joy hmm. your peace is not negotiable find your peace i you know when i got breast cancer i quit my life and started a new one and moved to the beach i had to find peace yeah, so whatever it takes it's not negotiable hmm. catrice nolan i'll say that the help that you need is available um, it might take a bit to find the information, but there are individuals, there are organizations who can help you find that information that you need to get through whatever the health challenge um, you are facing. And just like Stacy said, nothing new under the sun, but there are new resources and there are new um, treatments every day. So don't give up. Um, don't give up. Dr. Tierney. So our resident theologian is in with us today, Pastor JT. So I will kind of step in um, with and say what he would normally say. You know, for us believers, we know that that God is a healer, you know. And so when we find ourselves at these crossroads of different health interactions, this is the opportunity for us to lean into our Heavenly Father even more and see him as the healer and get to know him in a deeper way as our healer. So making sure that you are leaning on your spiritual community, that you are really tapping into that space and know that you will be healed and you are already healed. Mm, thank you for sharing that. Dr. Gloria Ivy Crow. Just would like to say, just reach out. Reach out to a friend. Reach out to a a health worker, reach out to someone to just get the reassurance, just to just sometimes share, just sharing, you'll be surprised what the next person has gone through and what they can give. I think what, what Catrice kind of talked about, which is important for all of us, is that when you reach out with someone who's gone through that same similar situation, it gives us hope. It gives us faith. And that's what we are all about is if we've got hope, it's something to live for. Absolutely. So when we come back, I'll give my reflection after the break. Bambase is pioneering a new era of social media and investment. This next generation social app has already raised $10 million and has just opened a new round to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. As bad as Trump was, his economy was worse, and black America felt it the most. He cut health insurance while giving tax breaks to the wealthy and big business. As president, I put money in pockets and capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month. There's a lot more to do, but we can do it together.
Welcome back everyone to A Balanced Life. And as you can tell, you can do the impossible. You have the capacity and the ability to reach your health goals, being able to communicate, understanding and educate yourself and your family and your friends about whatever it is that you're going through. I have to applaud Booker T. Washington back in April of 1915 of getting this movement going so that now we have this opportunity to celebrate National Minority Health Month. His quote is very simple. When we do not have health and long life, all else fails. And I must agree with that. When we do not have health and long life, all else fails. It's important to us that we understand where we are in our health journey so that we can advocate for ourselves, see the disparities when they are there, but then also make certain that we put our voice in motion so that we can make certain that others don't experience anything that we have if it was not positive. Thank you all for watching today and cheers to your good health. Bye now.